Good afternoon again, intuitives. I wanted to come back and wrap up the video I was doing yesterday on the narcissism of neoliberalism, where I left off uh, in the last video, I was talking about how the neoliberals in the nominal left party, like the Democrats, try to use identity politics in making people think that they're progressive, like, hey, we have, you know, more diverse people in office, and while that's great, but if, but if those people aren't for the right policies and are just continuing the same Clintonite ideology, what's the point? I mean, honestly, I, I don't know. If anybody can answer that, please put it in the comments. What's the difference if, you know, it's Joe Biden or if it's Kamala Harris doing the exact same policies that Joe Biden would do anyway. So, and that's been the game they've been playing for a little bit. And you can see how, you know, they genuinely don't even uh, believe, really, in diversifying who's in power. Because look at how they act. So in 2016, they pushed Hillary over Bernie. Hillary was the establishment candidate. And, you know, oh, she would be the first female president. Um, to be fair, if you want to talk diversity, Bernie Sanders would have also been the first Jewish president. Now you get to 2020, the establishment throws its weight behind Joe Biden. It's like, wait a minute, I thought four years ago you said, no old white men, Bernie's too old. Biden and Bernie are the same age, you know, and Biden wouldn't be the first anything. We've had a Catholic president, we've had a president with dementia, too. You know, like I said, Bernie's an old white guy, but he would have been the first Jewish president. I mean, that's something. And it's the same you see it with the female candidates. Like, you know, it, I, I was a big supporter of Tulsi Gabbard, and they smeared her left and right. You know, and this is somebody, Tulsi's a woman of color. She would have been the first Hindu president, first female president. And she's also a military veteran. You know, she's a combat, combat medic who still serves in the reserves at the officer's rank of major and yet they smeared her why because she challenged their status quo and the other thing is you see the establishment candidates they don't really believe in anything they want power for power's sake and to just preserve the status quo because they've benefited greatly from it from their donors you know usually through let's just say dodgy means at best all right, you take Hillary Clinton. I don't know what Hillary Cl Hillary Clinton was running to be president for. I know she wanted to be the first female president, but she wanted power for power's sake. That's pretty narcissistic. Joe Biden, his whole campaign was, you know, I'm not Trump. Okay, everybody else besides you is also not Trump. Whereas you go like someone like Bernie Sanders, whether you agree with it or not, you know, he wanted Medicare for all and and to raise taxes on the rich and finally end voodoo economics. Elizabeth Warren wanted to re-regulate Wall Street, you know, bring back Glass-Steagall and uh, regulate corporations, break up monopolies. Tulsi Gabbard wanted to end the wars. You know, these are all populist things that a lot of people agree with, you know, and the more populist candidates, um, some believed in some different uh, progressive ideals more than others, but each of them had things that you can say unequivocally that, that they believed in. Uh, and then you see some of the more centrist ones who just want in the power, just, you know, using the language of being progressive to try to get elected. Like Kamala Harris tried to jump on the Medicare for all. She didn't push for it at all. You know, she didn't, you know, she rightfully railed against Joe Biden in the primaries, and that was awesome, but she caved as soon as she was offered a position of power, and she's just another corporatist. I mean, you know, look at her record. When she was Attorney General of California, uh, she was presented a ton of evidence that Steve Mnuchin, Trump's Treasury Secretary, then the president of One West Bank, was illegally foreclosing early on uh, people during the housing crisis in 0809, particularly like older widows. And she was strongly urged to prosecute him, and she didn't. And it's no coincidence 
in my opinion, that Steve Mnuchin was a big uh, campaign contributor to her when she ran for Senate. So someone like that, you know, who's just going to be a continuation of the status quo, I don't see why I would vote for that person. You know, I mean, their story may be different, their background may be different, but what's going to change? You know, in contrast, someone, you know, and I've been disappointed by some of the progressives in power, too, with their voting record, like how AOC and Biden, Warren, and really most of the squad have been caving to Joe Biden. So to me, the, the up-and-comer in the progressive movement, someone who I truly believe believes in what she says, and, you know, I enjoy her speeches. She's very passionate, and she knows how to get a crowd riled up, and that's Nina Turner. I would, you know, I would love to vote for Nita Turner someday. I think she would bring real change, and I don't think she's corruptible. I, I really don't. I think if she was going to sell out, she would have done it by now. So there's someone, you know, that those of us that believe in more progressive ideals still have hope in. That's our new hope. I don't want to use Star Wars terminology, which I'm not that into, but it's popular, so I'll got to play the popular game once in a while, even as an INFJ. Alright, now why I mention all this is what happens when you have neoliberalism? It causes boom-bust cycles and it causes austerity on pretty much everybody below the upper middle class. So, you know, neoliberalism, great if you're in the top 20%, particularly the top 1% and the top 0.1%. But, you know, you're doing pretty good if you're in the top 20%. Everybody else, there's austerity and the opportunity that was there in the during the post-war consensus isn't there for you anymore. So the working class lost their union jobs um, across the pond in Britain. Think industries that used to be run by by the government became privatized and changed so that the owners could make a buck. Pensions went away. Pensions were reduced. You know, there was talk of selling off pieces of the NHS, even don't do that, trust us, don't do that. There's a reason why the United States is the only Western democracy that has privatized health care. You know, if it was the greatest ever, why are we ranked 17th? Why do we pay double what we pay? Why are we the only nation that does it that way? Well, the answer to that is money in politics. But what I wanted to get to was... When there's austerity for so long, as Professor Mark Blight explained, and like I said, you can listen to interviews of him on Jimmy Jor's channel, and he has his own channel. He's a really intelligent guy, and I like his dry Scottish sense of humor, too. But, so you have austerity. That's what makes the working class desperate, because the working class feels ignored. They're told they have to fall behind these centrists who are just, you know, Republican light or Tory light, who are just doing pretty much the same thing that the right-wing party would do, albeit watered down a little bit, and ignoring the needs of the working class. So the working class gets desperate, and they start looking for a demagogue to anybody who will listen to them, anybody who will pay attention to them. And that's how far-right neo-fascists rise up. You know, we saw it in the United Kingdom in 2009 when... Nick Griffin would, and I think another guy too, I think there were two uh, from the BNP that were elected MEPs to the European Parliament. And, you know, the, the, a far-right party in Britain had never made it that far before, and that was scary. You know, I remember seeing the documentary, because a friend of mine was a part of it, a friend of mine from college who was in the UK, uh, had something to do with the whole Battle for, for Barking documentary years back when, when uh, old fat Hitler tried to win the uh, the parliament seat in Barking and Dagenham, and he was defeated. But the only reason he had a chance there is because who he was running against. You know, Margaret Hodge, Blairite, she said it herself in the documentary, I remember it, saying how Labour became complacent, you know, and felt entitled to those votes and that they would always win there because... A working class area is never going to vote Tory, so they have to fall in line behind the centrist Blairite. You know, same thing here in the United States. We had the rise of Trump. The Rust Belt fell. Why? Because Trump told them what they wanted to hear. You know, NAFTA destroyed this area. Ross Perot warned everybody, you know, but well, 
19% of the country listen. He did the best of any third party candidate ever. Uh, but, you know, Clinton sided with the Republicans, passed NAFTA, destroyed all those jobs. Obama, in 2008, railed Hillary on it in, uh, in the primary, but then turned around and continued Clinton's legacy for the most part, and then was shouting at the top of his lungs during his lame duck time that he wanted the TPP, which would only be worse than NAFTA. So when Trump came along and told those people that they would bring them their jobs back, after decades of austerity, you know, I think the majority of people who voted for him didn't vote for him because of his racism and sexism. They did that in spite of it. I mean, a lot of women voted for Trump the first time in 2016. You know, when people get desperate, they're willing to try anything but the status quo, you know. Like, I think a lot of people who voted for Trump didn't really believe what he was saying would be the solution, but they knew the solution wasn't more of the same with Hillary Clinton, who was pretty much trying to tell people that everything was fine, because, you know, Hillary Clinton and all her all her uh, lobbyists and all her rich friends, yeah, they're doing great. What's the problem? Yeah, they're doing great because they've been stealing the... Uh, the money from productivity from the workers. See, when neoliberalism went into effect in the 80s, wages in real terms froze. You know, I mean, yes, there's been inflation, but wages have not risen since the 80s. It used to be workers as productivity raised, so did worker wages. That hasn't been the case since Reagan. So the rich keep getting richer and richer, and now we have the biggest economic disparity between rich and poor since the Gilded Age, and as Mark Blythe loves to say, you know, the Hamptons are in a defensible position. And that's basically a reference to the French Revolution, because eventually, you know, when things get too bad, people get desperate. And to quote him one more time, he said, what do you think is going to ha happen in a country like America filled with a bunch of angry people with guns? So, not that I'm advocating that, but it's, you know, the masses have been known to rise up in the past. It's the whole learn from history lesson. So now, neoliberalism has, 40 years on, has truly failed. You've had the rise of far-right demagogues. You know, Trump and Farage are like the faux right-wing populists. Like, they try to pretend that they're populists while trying to continue the same policies for the, for the most part. I mean... From what I've read, like, Farage, aside from wanting out of the EU, is Margaret Thatcher. The same Thatcherite agenda. Privatize everything in sight. He even wants to go after pieces of the NHS. Yeah, because, you know, I think American insurance companies may be giving him money. I don't know, but I've seen him on Fox News, and I know they give them a lot of money. So I don't know, but it's, you know, it's, it's a possibility. Can't rule it out. Um, you know, Trump... Yeah, I mean, he stopped TPP, and I guess credit where credit's due, that was good, but aside from that, with his tax cuts, his military budget, it was George W. Bush all over again. Same old, you know, slight tweaks around the edges, but same old status quo, same old people benefit. And look what it's done to us in the younger generations. Can't get on the housing ladder. Rents through the roof. Over in the UK, you know, the availability for... Uh, Council flats isn't there for Gen X and younger like it was there for the boomers. The union jobs are gone. College, which here I explained it's triple to go to a state university as an in-state student as it was for the boomers. Pensions, those are just for boomers. 40-hour uh, work week, boomers only. It seems that everything that they told us to work for our whole lives... And, you know, for a lot of us, we did exactly what they said because they're the all-knowing boomers. After doing exactly what they said, we got nothing. And they're like, well, what's the problem? You don't deserve it anyway. You think just by doing what we did that you deserve the same opportunity as us? Like, we're, 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 we're baby boomers. Like, we're, we're gods. That's, that's the mentality of a lot of these people. And, again, I'm not going to say it's every baby boomer. You know, I'm saying it's... The baby boomer supremacists, which is, you know, the ones who believe in the superiority of the baby boomer generation. So it's basically saying they're superior based on the year they were born. It's, yeah, it's sick. And it needs to be called out.
and I hope more people will start to do it. People have been starting to call out the boomers because the jig is up. They, they know we know. They know we know that they stole our economic future to enrich themselves because of their own narcissism and greed. So, you know, the new game is trying to get everybody to settle for more neoliberalism, trying to prop up Biden like he's FDR. He's not. He's not done any of the progressive things he promised. Raise the minimum wage. Nope. Universal health care. Nope. Public option. Nope. Student loan debt relief. Nope. End the wars. Nope. Oh, and, you know, this coming from the richest country in the world and the only Western democracy that didn't give its people monthly COVID relief during the pandemic. Like, you know, there was unemployment of up to 50%. We didn't do, you know, a sort of UBI thing like every other industrialized nation did. And we're also the, also the only other country during that pandemic where not everybody had health care. But we have the richest people, you know. We have plenty of billionaires that are doing great. Yeah. So I just wanted to wrap that up. I didn't want to go too much longer on a rant about that. But you're looking at the result of 40 years of, of neoliberalism. And whether you're a populist on the left or the right, there are things we agree on. And, you know, there's a lot we disagree on, too. But I think for the time being, we should at least try to compromise on someone who can take down the neoliberal establishment. Like, if we can get, like, another, like, Ross Perot type that's kind of like a centrist populist that can break the, the neoliberal, neoconservative duopoly, that might be the first start. I don't know. I'm not claiming to have the solutions on how to fix things. I'm just saying the status quo is broken and we need to do something different because this is unsustainable and it's only going to get worse. Thank you for those who took the time to listen to this whole video. I know it's long and I'm not going to get political very often, but I thought it necessary to mention how a lot of the narcissism and greed and exploitation and entitlement that those in power have today that are predominantly white male baby boomers that began with the rise of neoliberalism in the late 70s and early 80s and that's why these people like Joe Biden who's like a demented walking death rattle is clinging on with you know with his death grip on power because he just wants power for power's sake and those in the club are doing great because of neoliberalism and the hell with everybody else. And they know they can't hold on much longer. You know, it's, it's the boomer generation that's holding the neoliberal status quo together. And they're getting up there in age. You know, they're, you know, that's the thing about them. Like, everybody's like, oh, well, you know, no, they're not. You know, they think, well, demographics never change that much. Yeah, there hasn't been a boomer born since 1964. There will come a day where they won't be around anymore. That's. That's just a fact. You know, they can't, and nobody else can live forever. So thanks for supporting the channel. Please like and subscribe. Uh, check out the video on if you want your story told on this channel, or if you just have a topic you would like a video done in general. My email and my PayPal is on that. It's also in the About section. Thank you for taking the time. And I'll see you next time. I'll get back to some of my more regular content.